A very good evening to all of you from the Chest Council of India. I would like to welcome you all to discuss a very, very uh, interesting and a very relevant topic that are the viral infections dominating bacterial infections? Is there an actual reversal of the saga then and now? Well, there used to be a time where anything and everything mnemonic used to be bacterial. But now everything and everything mnemonic is is predominantly viral and okay by chance bhi kabhi kabhi bacteria mil jata hai. So I would like to welcome you all to a very very interesting discussion today with a panel of very um, special doctors spanning all over India and uh, I would like to introduce my panel. We have our pediatrician first of all Dr. Vibhu Kavatra who is a pulmonologist and pediatrician from New Delhi. And he has his own nursing home and is going to set up a second clinic also. So, the right guy to understand pediatrics form. Then we have Dr. Deepti Krishnan, a real uh, means she's uh, beaming with energy and enthusiasm. She is an assistant professor at the Hassan Medical College and a consultant pulmonologist at Sanjeevni Hospital. Welcome, Deepti, ma'am. Then we have the young and energetic Dr. Atul Francis, who is a consulted pulmonologist at MAJ Hospital, Adapalli, Kochi. And we have our uh, Dr. S.K. Toke. Uh, Toke Saab is very much there, but unfortunately, the Pune light is not supporting him. Sir is an interventional pulmonologist and intensivist working in Pune. He is a very dynamic and very academic person, always uh, ready for a good academic discussion. And we have the most special member of our all, uh, joining from the southeast uh, part of India, Dr. Tony Luke Baby, a senior consultant interventional pulmonologist from Tiruvalla Medical Mission Hospital from Tiruvalla, Kerala. Welcome, Tony. All of us have gathered here to discuss, and yeah, I am Dr. Ravi Dosi. I practice in Indore, which is in Madhya Pradesh, Central India. So, all of us have come together from north, south, uh, west, center. All of us are here to discuss this phenomena that has really the viral uh, taken over the bacteria. So to, to understand this, I have two very interesting presentations lined up in which Dr. Deepti will be initiating our discussion by talking on the epidemiology of infections, followed by the most common viral infections that we hear nowadays. Dr. Atul will be talking on those. So I hand it over to you now, Dr. Deepti, for your presentation. Good evening to one and all. I'll be covering epidemiology and characteristics of community-acquired pneumonia, a virus versus bacteria. So coming to the 2019 Global Burden of Disease study, which showed that almost 489 million people were affected with lower respiratory tract infection, that is including pneumonia and bronchiolitis globally, out of which the children below 5 and adults above 70 were the most affected. So aspiration pneumonia contributed to almost 5 to 15% of those cases with very bad outcomes in the older people uh, with multiple comorbidities. An overall global study showed that 7 lakh children died, or that is 14% of deaths of children under 5 due to CAP. In India alone, there were 45 million episodes per year with 6.6 .6 million hospitalizations that contributed to 24% of the national disease burden. When you really look deep into the risk factors, the children uh, predominantly had prematurity, malnutrition, household air pollution, a suboptimal breastfeeding, et cetera. Whereas in adults, they had an underlying respiratory disease, COPD, bronchiectasis, or diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, and chronic liver disease. The men had a higher risk of community-acquired pneumonia than women, and another interesting factor was active cancer was a very strong independent predictor of 30-day mortality in CAP. A secondary analysis of an international multicentric study from 54 countries found that almost one in five cases which were hospitalized with CAP were not immunocompetent. So 18% had uh, more than one risk of immunodeficiency. 45% were on chronic steroid use, 25% had hematological cancer, and 22% were on chemotherapy. 
When you go further deep and try to see any pathogen specific risk factor, there is a whole lot of information for bacterial pneumonias ranging from Streptococcus, Legionella, MRSA, but no such information could be found on virus specific, uh, pathogen specific risk factor. So a big gap in uh, the literature there. Coming to the microbiology a Europe study, let me focus here only on the red and the green color, red representing viral and a green representing bacterial. So the Europe study showed that viral cases were 7% and bacterial was more, which was reversed in the USA, where viral cases were 22% and uh, bacterial was only 11 In India, on the other hand, though the predominant was bacterial, Viruses were gaining ground and were almost equal to our endemic TB, as uh, being represented by the pink color there. And with the raising COVID cases, I looked into the, uh, the counter uh, of the COVID section and found that though the pre present uh, counter showed 44, 4 crore, 47 lakh, 68 thousand plus cases, just yesterday in a single day, that is April 12th, there was 7,830 new infections taking the tally, uh, to, uh, tally higher up and 16 new deaths in a single day alone. So why was this really happening? A recent preliminary study showed that SARS-CoV-2 had a competitive effect with other respiratory viruses which were in circulation. So when they are at their annual peak, even COVID seems to be spreading rapidly, which may explain the present rise in cases. When in an Indian cohort study for pre uh, pediatrics, it was 15% cases predominantly by respiratory sensational virus. So uh, by respiratory virus were the uh, frequent cause of pneumonia, almost 66% in children with respiratory sensational virus, rhinovirus and metanumovirus. The pandemic of 2009, that is the H1N1 pandemic also affected the children more. Whereas in contrast, the SARS-CoV pandemic affected the adults more. So when we are seeing virus versus bacterial, let us not forget that there is a whole range of viral bacterial co-infection cases. So the influenza pandemics of 1918, 57, 68 all showed that most of the deaths had probably resulted from a secondary bacterial pneumonia on a primary viral. Whereas H5N1 was a primary viral infection, H1N1 had 4 to 24% of secondary bacterial infection. And the most frequent combination was a rhinovirus with a strep pneumonia and an influenza A and a strep pneumonia. So these co-infections seem to be associated with more severe pneumonia and raised mortality. Even H1N1 alone, the fatal cases, when they had gone back and done a histopathology, there was evidence in 29 of the 100 cases showing bacterial co-infection. So here's a table that is having the virus and what is the predominant known bacterial co-infection and what are the secondary infections that can be predicted in them. So coming to uh, mortality, globally, when you see in a treatment setting, it was found that hardly less than 1% mortality in an outpatient setting, 4 to 18 in a hospital ward, and 50% in the ICU. In fact, in the past 15 years alone, uh, mortality rate of children in India seems to have really gone bonkers and has gone really high up uh, in India alone. So how do we really differentiate between vir virus and bacteria? Predominantly, initially, we have to start with a good past medical history. So use of immunosuppressive drugs, any recent history of influenza-like illness, close contact with children, nursing home uh, residents, any recent history of travel to areas with different climates, and any data regarding their annual influenza vaccine are the essential information. Apart from that, there are certain factors that suggest a viral cause and some that suggest a bacterial cause. So age, predominantly a child, will be more suggestive of viral cause. Any local ongoing viral epidemic, yes, again, a viral cause. A slow onset, viral cause, whereas a rapid onset is bacterial cause. Seeing the clinical profile, a predominant upper respiratory rhinitis and wheezing could be a viral cause, whereas high fever and tachypnea could be a bacterial cause. Seeing the biomarkers, we already know a total blood count on the lower side suggests viral, high counts, bacterial, CRP, low CRP, viral, high 60, bacterial. 
In fact, in a study in pediatrics, they even said that for it to be bacterial in a pediatric, it has to go more than 80 milligram per liters. A procalcitonin concentration would really have more of a negative predictive value of for bacterial infection. That means a negative uh, low value suggesting no bacteria. So less than 0.1 micrograms per liter viral, more than 0.5 bacterial. Chest radiograph, not very suggestive. Coming to the diagnosis, predominantly we are uh, uh, preferring a nasopharyngeal aspirate in children because you're getting both nasal and nasopharyngeal uh, sample. And it was found that 95% showed respiratory viruses. In adults, on the other hand, more than a throat swab, we prefer a nasopharyngeal swab. And again, in that, we prefer a flocked swab. Now, what is a flocked swab? That is the traditional fiber swab on the left. And on the right, we find the flock swab, which showed more than 90% sample collection. So again, complications for both viral and bacteria are almost the same, sepsis, cardiovascular disease, with almost 90% of cardiac complications occurring within seven days of the pneumonia and half within the first 24 hours. A decline in cognition and even 57% increase in the risk of dementia after CAP. So let me end with prevention. Again, going back to vaccines, a study in the US and Europe when uh, it was compared the adults of more than 65 had less number of cases of pneumonia in USA compared to Europe. When the reason was really looked into, it was found that there was a higher proportion of patients of uh, the adult population having vaccinated for pneumococcal and influenza vaccine. So that's a very strong, uh, good suggestion for vaccination being a good preventive measure. Let me end the slide with this mask, uh, be, uh, propagating the mask. So here's a COVID carrier without a mask, the transmission probability being 70% if the healthy contact doesn't, uh, even though the healthy contact has a mask. Whereas a carrier with a mask and a healthy contact without a mask brings down the transmission probability to 5%. If both are wearing the mask, then the transmission probability is only 1.5. So a huge thumbs up to the mask there for preventing viral infections. Apart from that, uh, of course, we know the safe distancing and uh, the hand hygiene. There are other measures also, and also vaccination. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Myself, Dr. Atul Francis. I work as a pulmonologist in MAJ Hospital at Apalli Kochi. Uh, I thank uh, CCI for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today I'll be discussing about viral pneumonias, the basic pathogenesis, the treatment protocols, the lab tests which are done. Uh, most of us are aware of all these things. I'll be discussing about H3N2 and COVID-19. As we all know, H3N2 is a variant of uh, your uh, spine flu influenza or H1N1. It basically has a um, um, gene in which uh, your virus M gene which is mutated. Uh, it is a, in 2011, it was first detected uh, with genes from the avian swine flu and human viruses and the 2009 H1N1 pandemic virus in gene. It's a, it is, it's mainly in pigs, but now it's circulating in humans as well. So this is a history of our H1N1 or H3N2 or all the subtypes which was done. As we see here in 1968, there has been reporting of H3N2, but it was more in swines. But in 2011, we have a first reported case of H3N2, which was there. So basically, when we are talking about the structure of virus, we know uh, like any influenza virus or a H1N1 virus, basically you have a hemagglutinin, a neuraminidase and an M2 receptor. And then you have basic uh, polymerase genes which are there. And uh, the M protein is one which is mutated and becomes the H3N2 subvariant. So as we all know, the mode of transmission, the most common mode of transmission is through airborne transmission. And you have transmission indirectly through objects, formites, close contacts, etc. Uh, it usually has an incubation period of one to four days. Uh, as we all know, like other viral infections, the shedding occurs, starts before the onset of symptoms. Uh, and, the and the shedding or the incubation period is peak on the day one of symptoms. The period of communicability varies. In children, it can last up to months. In adults, it's between four to six days. So as we all know, when you're coming to clinical presentation, we basically have three types. You have an uncomplicated and a complicated influenza and a life-threatening complicated influenza. So uncomplicated influenza is the one in which you have a basic upper respiratory tract symptoms like fever, cough, uh, 
throat pain, sore throat, myalgia, headache, etc. But the cough, uh, this is the most common complaint that most of the patients come for us. Uh, the cough or the dry cough which persists for more than two weeks and it can end up in wheezing in many of the patients. Then you have complicated influenza in which you have your LRTI symptoms. You have your cough with expectoration, you have a breathlessness, your chest in drawing, tachypnea, tachycardia, etc. Many of them even presents with seizures and CNS symptoms as well. And they require hospital admission. So the most common complication which we always need to think about while talking about the H3N2 is many of the patients don't come, as, uh, come to us when the patient has a viral prodrome. They mostly come to us with a secondary bacterial infection. Uh, this occurs mainly around uh, 2 to 14 days after he has recovered from a viral infection. There will be a recurrence of cold and dyspnea and the most common organism causing this is streptococcus pneumoniae followed by haemophilus influenzae and staphylococci. Now, lab diagnosis, as we all know, the swab testing is the mainstay of diagnosis of influenza A, B, H3N2, H1N1, etc. Uh, the viral cultures can be done, but viral culture is a long and tedious process. It is expensive and it takes time. Then you have to do routine blood investigations to basically when you are giving oseltamivir, you have to look for the renal function. You have to maintain a blood uh, strict blood glucose level. And you have to always uh, look for other things like lipid profile, etc. Because these are the many a times, these are the these things get first detected when the patient presents with a viral infection. So the swab testing, as we all know, RT-PCR is the mainstay. It uh, takes about four hours for reporting. Uh, then you can look for the antigen as well as a viral uh, neutralizing antibody increase. But our most common done is reverse transcriptase PCR. And the sample can be either a nasopharyngeal swab or a throat swab or a tracheal aspirate. Then there is something called as a new lamp H1N1 kit. It, it was launched in India, but it uh, didn't uh, acquire the status it was supposed to get because uh, it doesn't usually detect between uh, influenza A and influenza B. So chest X-ray, I'll be discussing in greater detail in COVID. As we all know, it can present with a pneumonia, basically mostly a bilateral pneumonia. And it, if it's a severe complicated illness, it can present with ARDS. So the mainstay of uh, treatment is isolating the patient, strict infection control measures and your supportive therapy. Then if the patient is complicated, you put him on ventilator, you treat the ARDS, you treat hypotension, you treat sepsis, etc. As we all know, oseltamivir is a mainstay of treatment which we have. Oseltamivir is a neuraminidase inhibitor and uh, it prevents new viral particles from being released. So the dose of oseltamivir, as we all know, is 75 milligram BD given for a period of five days. And this is according to the weight band. If the patient has a very low weight, like very 24 to 40 kg, we give 60 milligram BD for a period of five days. Oseltamivir syrups are also available for infants for less than three months, three to five months and six to 11 months. It's basically a neuraminidase inhibitor. One thing we have to keep in mind, the most common adverse effect of oseltamivir is GI symptoms that you get diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, etc. Another important point which had to be used is uh, in patients with renal failure, we had to be very careful regarding the dose of oseltamivir which we are giving to the patient. Then as we all know, there is category A, B and C. In A, you get home isolation, patient has mild upper respiratory tract symptoms. In category B, you have a high grade fever plus sore throat and also in pregnant women greater than 65 years, comorbid and immunocompromised condition. In such cases, you give oseltamivir and you give a broad spectrum antibiotics for CAP and category C is severe illness in which you have to admit and treat the patient accordingly. And vaccine selection, as we all know, the influenza vaccination which we take is effective against H3N2 as well. The vaccine strain keeps on changing every year. The vaccine strain for Northern Hemisphere currently, according to WHO guidelines, is this one. You had two types of vaccines. You have a trivalent vaccine as well as a <coughs> quadrivalent vaccine. And it is given, uh, it's an inactivated vaccine given frequency yearly. And other drinks, other drugs which are under trial, it's Zanamavir, Paramavir. Amantadin has developed resistance. It's no longer recommended by CDC. And you have a Leninamavir, which is on phase three trials and is approved in Japan. Then next coming to COVID-19. Uh, so as we all know, in the last three years, we have been discussing in great detail and in depth regarding COVID-19. As we all know, COVID-19 is what uh, is a pandemic which started in 2020, the first case detected in Wuhan in China. India has been uh, grasped by the COVID-19 and we had a very, very long and tedious journey with COVID-19 with uh, so much of mortality, so many complications, etc. So this is the basic structure of COVID-19 in, in which we have a spike glycoprotein, a membrane glycoprotein, you have an envelope protein and a nucleocapsid 
protein. So this is the basic life cycle of coronavirus. Just like any other virus, it enters into your body, it gets uh, enters into your DNA, it replicates with your DNA, and then it's exocytosed. So basically, when you're talking about pathogenesis of COVID-19, you have basically at three stages. You have early infection, pulmonary phase, and a hyperinflammation phase. So your cytokine storm. So initial stages, you have mild cough, fever, breathlessness, etc. And you in blood count, you will have a lymphopenia. Um, and later stage, in pulmonary stage, you get breathlessness, cough with expectoration, hypoxia. And in hyperinflammation stage, you get a cytokine storm. You will have inter increased interleukin C, CRP levels, and you have a hypercoagulability as well. So when you are talking about COVID-19, uh, Indian government or the guidelines divides into mild, moderate, and severe. The criteria here is in mild patient has low, uh, no, uh, normal upper respiratory symptoms. He might have slight breathlessness, but he doesn't have hypoxia. In moderate, what we have is there is a decrease in saturation between 90 to 93. RR is greater than or equal to 24. And he has other symptoms like fever, cough, breathlessness, hypoxia. And it's managed in a dedicated COVID center. Patient has pneumonia but no severe disease. And in severe disease, you can differentiate it into two, severe pneumonia and ARDS. ARDS, as we all know, as per the Berlin criteria, you classify it into mild, moderate, severe. Severe pneumonia is one in which your saturation is less than 90, your RR is greater than or equal to 30, and patient requires high-grade oxygen support. And your severe pneumonia can also result in a sepsis or a septic. Sep it can go into sepsis or it can end up in a septic shock as well. As we know, symptoms of sepsis is uh, deranged mental function, low oxygen saturation, reduced output, bradycardia, etc. And you get septic shock in which your mean arterial pressure is greater than or equal to 65, and lactate is greater than 2. Then this is the Indian government guidelines for treating mild, moderate and severe cases. In mild cases, it's mainly hand uh, isolation, symptomatic management. High risk for severe diseases is age greater than 60, co comorbid condition, diabetes, etc. Antibiotics should not be used unless indicated. And the drugs which are not to be used in COVID-19, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, HCQ, ivermectin, your monoclonal antibody, convalescent plasma, molnupiravir, favipravir, azithromycin, doxycycline. The moderate disease you admit in ward for treating the cytokine storm or because patient is hypoxic, you give him steroids, either DEXA 6 mg per day or methylprednisolone 32 mg in four divided doses. You give a prophylactic an anticoagulant like a low molecular weight heparin or a subcutaneous heparin and you do monitoring of your CRP levels, interleukin 6 levels, ferritin levels, etc. Severe disease, depending on whether it's ARDS, whether it's severe pneumonia, you treat the patient. You give him oxygen support if needed, HFNC, NIV, intubation, treat septic shock if that is there, give a low volume, low tidal volume ventilator support if needed. Then other thing is remdesivir, which is there, but remdesivir is only to be used within the first 10 days. Government doesn't give strict uh, guidelines. They are like, you may or may not use. Your CT score should be more than 10. It is given for a period of five days. Tocilizumab may be used if the patient has a moderate to severe disease with no improvement in 24 to 48 hours. So this is a serological testing. As we all know, you have your RT-PCR, you have your rapid antigen test and your COVID antibody testing. And lab investigation, basically, you look for CBC, you look for neutrophil lymphocytic ratio, you look for CRP, interleukin C, LDH levels, and you look for hypercoagulability. Then when you're coming to CT scan, you basically have various stages which are there. As we all know, it, it begins with a uh, ground glassing opacity, which progresses into consolidatory changes, crazy paving, end up in fibrosis or heals or healing and there can be secondary bacterial infections, cavitations, mucomycosis, etc. Then we have CORAD scoring which is there. Treatment I have already discussed. The mainstay of treatment is steroids and your anticoagulants. The monoclonal antibodies, it was something which was used initially but now the task force doesn't recommend it. Molnupiravir was an oral drug that came up. It's not longer recommended. Similar with favipravir as well. Paxlovid is something which was uh, approved in um, abroad countries. Then post covid complication, the most it, it, it's called a long COVID if your symptoms persist for more than 12 weeks. And the most common complication is breathlessness, wheezing, uh, tachycardia, uh, fatigue, insomnia, and, the, and a psychological impact. It has a very bad psychological impact, especially on patients who had severe pneumonia. Then vaccines, as we all know, we have a Covishield vaccine, we have a Covaxin, we have Sputnik V which is there, all these are three are there in the vaccination program. Now under trial, you have the Zyco D, Covax and Cobivax, which is there. So vaccines are also approved in pediatric age group greater than 12 years. And it's also approved for pregnant females. 
so this in a nutshell is regarding all the viral pneumonias uh, a basic nutshell now we'll have a panel discussion on this in which we'll be discussing further this was just to give a brief outline and a brief quick recap of uh, h3n2 as well as uh, covid pneumonia thank you well uh, thank you uh, atul uh, and thank you dr deepthi for uh, giving a very very good overview of what we are going to be discussing today so i would like to uh, begin our discussion already we have such a lot of questions piling in i would like to involve my panelists now and um, i would like to start with dr toke from pune dr toke what is the difference in between an infection and a pneumonia means are we talking about the same thing or they are all different yeah actually uh, this is a different infection is a uh, invasion of body of any organism by disease causing agent and its replication in the tissue or cells of the organism as well as uh, multiplication followed by development of uh, interaction between the tissue as well as those multiplied uh, agent as well as effect produced by that uh, toxins which has been produced by that uh, agent so uh, as far as lung or our yeah. respiratory tract is concerned uh, whenever there is myco mucosal uh, involvement then we call it as an infection but when it goes down into the alveoli there is flooding of the alveoli with the inflammatory exudate so there will be development of this pneumonia so what are the criteria to say it as a pneumonia uh, if patient is having some lrt lrt symptoms like breathlessness may not may may or may not be there in pleuritic kind of chest pain within last 7 days without x ray i am telling all these findings without x ray clinical findings then if patient is having any systemic features like uh, temperature more than 37.7 degree uh, centigrade and uh, development of uh, some breathlessness in such kind of patient or patient is having uh, fever or rigors out of these one or two symptoms if they are present and uh, on auscultation we are going to auscultate these uh, patients there will be some bronchial breathing or crepitations on auscultation in that uh, particular area and there is no explanation for all those things so these are without the chest x ray when we call pneumonia but with the chest x ray all these findings out of these some findings may be their clinical picture may be there there is a uh, uh, some new occurring radiological infiltrates in less than uh, means uh, last one week and which has not been explained by the pulmonary edema and pulmonary infarction so that is a basic difference uh, between the infection of uh, infection and the pneumonia as far as our Oh, very well elaborated I, often you know even while discussing for this webinar often we used to uh, like commonly exchange the term infection and pneumonia but i think dr vibhu was very particular ki are bhai we are, what are we talking about so dr vibhu i'd like to rope you in and you corrected us all throughout our presentation for the webinar now i would like to ask you the about the status in children Uh, and okay. are there any risk factors that you would like to elaborate on these sort of infections oblique pneumonia or pneumonia so first thing you need to understand is there about 4 lakh children every year below 5 die in india so due to whatever reasons and mostly it's uh, the respiratory reasons now if you see uh, the ari in india below 5 years of age uh, is about 2.7% that's the incidence so you can imagine two out of every th or rather i would say three out of every 100 are getting infection in some form or the other uh, of the respiratory thing now if you see the upper respiratory infections what do we expect the youngest one would be the most vulnerable it's actually the 18 to 23 month old who are more vulnerable they contribute uh, you know uh, more as compared to the 6 to 11 month and then you have the others and uh, there is always a male preponderance so you know as pediatrics we always say that uh, you know if uh, if uh, in delivery also we say that if a baby is born and there is a uh, respiratory distress or uh, there is meconium stain like or whatever and if the baby is female 
there is more chances the baby will uh, come out if it, it's a male then obviously we are going to face uh, more troubles so that is also reflected in uh, you know under 5 also uh, it's basically the male preponderance is about 63% as compared to 37% in females and in india you have uh, a mixture of uh, pneumococcal you have the haemophilus influenza you have uh, the respiratory syncytial virus which is there and uh, if you see the risk factors i think the most important risk factors which we have is poverty so in india we have a major issue of poverty we have an issue of sanitation another issue is overcrowding and then malnutrition which is there so if you see th these are all the risk factors and one more thing is why this uh, respiratory infections are more important in the children as compared to adults is because the immune system is actually not fully developed we normally say that it takes about uh, 5 to 7 years and up to about 12 years for your immune system to fully develop so the first 5 years are the most vulnerable time period and uh, this is uh, these are the basic risk factors which are there right so uh, very well answered and elaborated and quite eye opening also uh, but tony bhai we very very commonly in adults also come across infections and pneumonias so would you like to talk about uh, talk a bit about respiratory infections and pneumonias in adults and some risk factors. Dr. Ravi? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, so the issue coming is <clears throat> right now after the COVID-19 uh, situation started, the actually maybe the focus on bacterial pneumonias have come down. Everybody is more predominantly into the uh, COVID and uh, then in the last one year, we are seeing more of a virus, uh, resurgence of the viral pneumonias. Uh, especially, like for example, that some one of the data that I looked through, it is showing, it is saying that in the uh, what our Integrated Disease Surveillance Program (IDSP) with the Integrated Health Information Platform of 2023, what they are seeing is that in the even up to the last uh, the January to March 5th of the nine weeks of data they have taken is S3N2 is more predominant for this year. What they are seeing, so but what we see is we don't get it as an isolated infection most of the time. It is usually probably a mix of H1N1, H3N2, or maybe even a mild COVID variant along with that. And what happens is the patients now, since we, we are not uh, much into that masking phase um, anymore, people come, they wait to the symptoms at home, probably they go through the viral phase and they end up with a, in back with us with a severe, in, in the bacterial pneumonia stage. That is a super added bacterial infection over the viral infection. So the issue what happens is that the, uh, the earlier when patients used to present to us, we, it would be a bit more simpler because we would directly be able to coordinate the symptoms and the findings and the blood reports. But now when we usually tend to get partially treated patients and usually self-treated patients, the diagnosis itself gets a bit complicated and we have to have a high index of suspicion of which patient may be going bad soon. So maybe the patient has walked in with maybe a respiratory, a slightly higher respiratory rate with a, maybe a history of a two-week back fever. And now what happens is he's developing a new onset cuff with dyspnea, but saturations may be maintained. It may be at 95, 96 range, but within the next 24 hours, it may suddenly drop. So at that time, if you have, we have seen, send the patient home saying, okay, try one antibiotic and come back. Then maybe probably the patient will come back in the night to the ED in a bad state. So that looks bad that we could not uh, decipher that this is going to happen. So we have to have a high index of suspicion that a patient at the present point of uh, treatment is going on will come to us maybe a bit later in the presentation than the spectrums we are discussing. Now, Dr. Atul and Dr. Deeply have very finely described all the symptoms possible, which we have to correlate when we are looking into each patient we meet. But the primary problem is that if we have the highest index of suspicion to send sputum cultures at the earliest, even in the OP basis, if we suspect this patient may not work on the oral antibiotics we are starting for him in the first place. So by the time we are starting the treatment, we have at least a good sample going up for culture. And we have genuinely good reports to follow up after that for the treatment. And usually, as we uh, when I did some research, we did not get much data on the uh, pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia uh, counts for India. But when, uh, overall, what we see is in community acquired pneumonia, 23% of the global burden is in from India, and 14 to 30% mortality is in those patients. And out of which, Streptococcus pneumonia is one of the most common organisms according to previous data. But I feel probably in the next one or two years, we'll be getting a totally different range of data coming up because of all these co-infections happening now. Thank you. Right. I, I would like to add Before. something to it. Yeah, basically, the thing is, uh, you know, uh, Tony was like, uh, it's basically the bacterial infection and the mixture is coming. We are used to it. 
you know, with children, it's always more of viral and less of bacterial. And we always have this trouble that you have secondary bacterial infection coming to us. Now, what uh, you mentioned is absolutely right. The half-hearted uh, treatment, which is usually done by the patients. And, you know, because I treat uh, both children as well as adults. And what I've seen post-COVID is people have been, I think, they, they've become very brash. They've started using antibiotics even in children so earlier i used to have uh, patients only the adults who used to take antibiotics usually the azithromycin used to be the thing you know it was basically a cold and cough medicine which was being used by the adults but now i've started facing so if i write imagine clarithromycin i write uh, revzil or those kind of uh, big antibiotics i use epiroxime in children and then the parents the next time the child has even simple cold cough they, they give that antibiotic and they give it for two days three days and then they come to you so I think that is something which is important because what happens is we are actually going to miss a lot of things. It may be a simple viral and in children it's mostly the only viral. You don't even have secondary infections, but you know, the antibiotics are given left, right, center. So what you are facing now in adults, we are we were facing in children, but we are facing the same mixture now. We probably have the similar kind of uh, setups now, the children and adults. Right, quite right. But uh, I agree with both of you. Very interesting point. Deepti, could you just help me out? <coughs> just enumerate what are these common infections that we are talking about? Can, can you just name a few? Sir, if you are talking of uh, pediatric, then as uh, sir has already mentioned, it is predominantly viral. So viral, again, uh, if, uh, if you are only looking for respiratory, then again, it is respiratory syncytial virus and there is metanumovirus and there is rhinovirus. Lot of cases of rhinovirus actually, when it, especially during the seasonal uh, uh, winter season, that is. Whereas uh, when you are looking at adult population, then I would say more of bacterial. So uh, strep pneumonia and H influenza and uh, even Klebsiella for that matter. So uh, more uh, range is on the bacterial side when it comes to adults. I would say. Right. So now let's try to hit it on the nail. Atul, tell me, give me a database justification. Are what we're talking about actually translated means, are the numbers also saying the same thing? All right. Sir. <clears throat> so there are many, uh, there are in many articles which mention about the uh, like specific etiotypes of whether it's a bacterial pneumonia or a viral pneumonia. What report I have is a report which came out from ICMR, which actually talked about the burden of respiratory viruses and their prevalence <clears throat> in a time period between 1970 to 2020. So one important thing to notice here is the viral PCR or the PCR methods of detecting the virus is something which came up at a later date. So initially, uh, whenever we were diagnosing viral pneumonia, it was more of symptom based. So how much of symptom based goes into data collection is something which we can't be sure about. So according to this uh, data, which came up, which was an article given by Rishabh Bagmode et al. in 19, uh, which gave the prevalence of viral pneumonia between 1970 to 2020. They specifically have told that more than 25 to 30 percentage of the pneumonia in children and around 50 to 60 percentage of the pneumonia in adults are undiagnosed. Means uh, not undiagnosed, there has, there, they haven't been able to find a etiology for it. So most probably might be a viral pneumonia. Then according to them, um, in 2000, there has been a spike of cases in 2007 and 2000, in 2009 and post-2020. So whatever was post-2020 is due to COVID. And in 2009, whatever came up was due to the H1N1 influenza, which was there. And they also have a data regarding which was the most <coughs> common organisms which were causing this. According to them, the most common was respiratory syncytial virus which contributed to around 32 to 42 percentage of the total pneumonias. And uh, even after 2007, with more of the um, diagnostic methods coming up, around 29 percentage was attributable to respiratory syncytial virus. And they have also classified <coughs> the pneumonias depending on the part of India which was involved. According to them, in North India, because of the cold weather or the cold climate, influenza and para-influenza viruses were mo more common. And in Western India, more of rhinovirus. And in South India, it was more of a respiratory syncytial virus. And one more thing, which I will say from personal experience, I was someone who was there in Pune for around five to six years, the last four or five years. And many of, especially during the time period of May to June or July, we used to have a huge spectrum of pneumonia, class, class. viral pneumonia, uh, viral pneumonia. 
many of the times it was undiagnosed because you can't do swab testing for everyone who are there many of the time the patient ends up in ventilator and when you are looking after the when you look after the clinical profile or the lab investigation it always points towards a viral pneumonia and many of them <coughs> presents to you with a bacterial pneumonia which is a super added secondary infection so according to these guidelines we can easily we these data which is there we can easily make sure that there has been a increase in viral pneumonia post 2007 and maybe pre 2007 it was mainly because of the diagnostic tests were in up to the mark because viral cultures were something which we don't do routinely now as now as we know because uh, the testing methods have increased even when you are doing a bronchoscopy or bal you have a biofire which is there the biofire or the panel also can detect a huge number of viruses so because of this we are getting the etiotypes more but but atul i would like to carry on the question with you and right. after epidemiology i would like to draw everybody's attention to what we all do we are all clinicians so atul tell me one thing how will you clinically diagnose a case of viral pneumonia so clinically diagnosing mostly it will be the symptom history of the patient the patient might have a high grade fever for one or two days he will have a sore throat or a, a running nose or a common cold and he will have a <clears throat> the cough will be mostly dry he will have a more of a dry cough and the symptom pattern will be and there will be more of myalgia and more of weakness compared to a uh, what do you say a bacterial pneumonia and in bacterial pneumonia you will have more of cough with a purulent expectoration in most of the cases you have a cough with a purulent expectoration so depending on the history so this is clinic and even when you are looking at a x ray or something if you do at a later date you might get a interstitial pattern which is there or a interstitial pattern of pneumonia and you can you and you always have to take history about whether there are other people suffering from the same complaints in your family because viral infections are something which have a very high transmissibility in especially in close contacts and depending on the seasonal variation as well whether there's a virus circulating at that point in time in the in your locality or in your area right quite very well yeah please please dr deepthi yeah and, and this was taught uh, well uh, uh, like when we were doing our uh, pgs that uh, if the x ray is not correlating with the clinical uh, uh, findings then suspect viral because uh, the patient condition is uh, you know deteriorating and uh, he's not responding but x ray is quite clear there's nothing much uh, to be seen on the x ray then suspect viral and uh, on the other hand in children uh when we see more of a toxic look on the child uh you know not, not much of uh, facial expressions the child is uh, really looking sick suspect bacterium and uh, you know the child may not look that uh, sick and uh, uh, with lot of sweating and flushing that and all that look is supporting a bacterial uh, more in a child and that is I I think what you wanted to say with clinical features and the normal X-ray, we generalize it to call it an atypical pneumonia. Basically, nowadays most commonly viral. But uh, again, coming back to our uh, the, our thought process on clinical diagnosis, Tony, why can you please tell us when how can you clinically diagnose a bacterial pneumonia? Ah, uh, I think Dr. Tony, you are mute. Sorry, sorry. um as dr atul mentioned what we are going to see is that there are a lot of symptom similarity between the viral spectrum and the bacterial spectrum now usually now if you are looking at a purely bacterial infection patient if, if there is no other associated exposure with another hospital patient or an another uh, sick house mate or somebody else who is involved in some treatment at home a simple patient who walks in we have to expect the patient having a new onset fever patient may have shivering may have chills may have a mild dyspnea or tachypnea that you might uh, clinically when you examine you might find crepitations usually maybe there might be a pleuritic chest pain sometimes and usually we have to uh, correlate with imaging also to to uh, decide our differential diagnosis and in which way we are going to approach the treatment but i would also like to uh, make a no, uh, mention that whatever i mention now may not be found in elderly patients because in elderly patients usually they are a bit immunocompromised their body systems may not respond the same way as young adults or other normal people respond so maybe they might have an altered sense state of consciousness as one symptom which they present in now if it is an already a known respiratory patient of an asthma or copd they may present in a type of respiratory failure that may be the presentation but the reason may be the infection underlying 
then along with that uh, a patient who is completely uncomfortable by having chest symptoms but has no fever that can also point out to a pneumonia in an elderly patient Thank you. Uh, that is also uh, called as a typical presentation of the pneumonia in the elderly population can say mm. so i, I think uh, yeah. i think ha uh, mere ko ek yes, uh, you know i would like to add a few things good hi uh, i like your background now it's better Yeah, sir. Yeah, <laughs> but light has. But anyway, been. so coming to the coming to the point, you know, you were talking of the symptoms. So it's like uh, you have the symptoms which are very different in the adults as compared to the children. In children, what happens is the child usually presents with a very high grade fever, uh, in a viral thing. And uh, see, another advantage which basically the adults have is that you have, uh, you know, you have more people who are sick in the house, so you have uh, more suspicion of viral. But let me tell you, child is the first one who gets the viral uh, thing into the house. so we we usually get the first the index case of the house is what we get so they usually come with a very high grade fever that can have with the chills and rigors they can be you know just don't think about the respiratory part they're going to have cold cough vomitings diarrheas you know they they are like uh, not feeding well so all these symptoms are there so if the child is presenting you with you know a very non specific kind and a overall a sick thing it's more of a viral it has a sudden onset another thing which we normally notice is that uh, the kind of nasal discharge because with uh, with children you always have the nasal discharge which is there yeah it, it's actually stuck up uh, on the on the nose side uh, it's dried up so you can just observe if it's yellow or greenish then you know that it could be a secondary bacterial infection but otherwise it's more or less a viral and what we have seen in last about 4 uh, months or so uh, like in delhi at least in the northern part of the india part If you see you are getting a lot of these viral conditions and the child is coming to you in a sick condition and they they actually respond well to the treatment too but the only thing what matters is how old is the child so if the child is too small if it's less than 2 years of age then a lot of times these children require admission just for supportive therapy not exactly for treatment so here you we have to act very fast we we don't really have time to think okay, okay it's bacterial viral kya hai so normally if you find any uh, you know of the features we don't wait for uh, these the blood tests and all to show anything we just uh, start with the antibiotic if we find any form of infection there but otherwise it's mainly the supportive therapy which works so the symptoms are more of a systemic rather than confined to the respiratory in case of the children Mm. Uh, Rahul bhai, may I interrupt? Yeah, please, please, please. Yeah, that uh, actually one uh, as Vidhu said, one point to focus on is that due to the COVID and the uh, lockdown that was there for the past uh, few years, I mean most of our type of elderly patients have not been exposed to the community normal infections which they would be seasonal. So as as a baseline, their immunity has already dropped during the isolation. and now as we go said when children go to school they bring in the infection from everywhere to those parents so that is why we we have to actually correlate between the young children going to school who are staying with grandparents so usually we can understand that the viral is the reason in those adult patients for developing that infection or the symptoms they are showing right so but dr toke there is one very important differentiation which is very difficult clinically can you tell us if we can differentiate between viral and fungal pneumonia Yes, sir. Actually, few points uh, we can discuss regarding viral. Viral regarding viral. Doctor Atul Francis has uh, very well elaborated. Viral will be uh, acute onset. Patient will be having high grade fever for a couple of days. Then uh, uh, there will be some family history or uh, in the family members also suffering from the same kind of illness in the mild or moderate severity or same severity we can say. But as far as uh, this uh, fungal pneumonia is concerned. that will be sub acute to chronic in one set and uh, if you we'll see background of the patients uh, viral pneumonia can happen in the immuno competent as well as immuno compromised host but as far as uh, fungal pneumonia or fungal infections are concerned the patients most of the time they will be immuno compromised host who are having poorly uncontrolled uh, diabetes who are having chronic kidney disease who are on the dialysis or patient with uh, a solid organ transplant recipient patient on immunosuppression for the hemopoietic stem cell uh, transplantation or patient on chemotherapy for the any kind of uh, cancer they are having or such kind of patients will be very much prone to get the this kind of pneumonia as uh, uh, dr atul already mentioned there will be dry up in the viral pneumonia but in uh, fungal pneumonia there may be dry up but 
most of the patient will have some kind of sputum that color may vary according to underlying etiology of that uh, fungal infection and coming towards uh, uh, radiological differentiation between viral and fungal pneumonia so uh, most of the time this viral pneumonia will be bilateral and there will be multiple patchy so ground loss opacities will be more and in the last stage patient can behave like a rds or chest x ray will be like fully up fluffy uh, shadows bilaterally and diffusely involve both lens but as far as uh, this uh, fungal pneumonia is concerned there will be some some uh, low bar consolidation or some nodular consolidation will be the patient may have some cavitating region surrounding consolidation or some signs of halo signs like in aspergillosis will get so such kind of uh, differentiation uh, will be there uh, as compared to the viral pneumonia in the radiological picture and course of the uh, viral pneumonia will be so much acute and where it will be chronic gradually progressing and can turn out helminant in the case of the fungal pneumonia quite right and i actually it's stuff yes. i think chronicity is the biggest thing that go uh, tilts it in favor of fungal pneumonia yes. as this of is uh, bacterial or uh, viral pneumonia but uh, okay now we are clinically now we understand how to pick up viral hai bacterial hai ya fungal hai but dr deepthi can you tell me that now what to do Uh, do you have any prediction score to prognosticate these patients? Where to treat these patients? How to treat these patients? Any prediction scores? So when we are discussing pneumonia as such, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, prediction scores. But uh, let me just categorize these mainly as those that help us differentiate whether uh, the patient needs a OPD setup or a ICU admission, and then there are those that help us to uh, look into the survival rate. the mortality rate that is uh, the prognosis and then there are a few scores which also help us see whether we are dealing with any particular specific uh, um, resistant pathogen so uh, let me start with uh, the icu uh, whether to decide how to decide whether the patient uh, needs an icu admission or not and uh, for that there are a lot of uh, old scores like we already knew about apache and uh, uh, psi score and curb 65 but uh, when the uh, new prediction uh, scores came out actually psi uh, scoring and curb uh, 65 fell short uh, in terms of deciding whether icu admission is required they are more preferably uh, useful when you want to decide about mortality so uh, whether uh, the patient has a high mortality uh, chance or a low mortality chance that can be decided by curb 65 and psi scores whereas uh, if you really want to look into the icu admission scores there is a very nice uh, new uh, prediction score called uh, smart cop and by smart cop itself uh, it is a mnemonic so very easy to remember also so uh, s uh, stands for systolic blood pressure m stands for multi low bar infiltrates a stands for albumin so every particular uh, new uh, alphabet has a corresponding uh, parameter so very easy to remember very very easy to apply also and uh, the more recent a drop scores and expanded a drop scores are also helpful they are a little variation on the curb 65 but uh, much more sensitive and uh, specific when it comes to applying it practically and uh, for pediatrics there is a modified uh, uh, pyro score which is uh, has a lot of parameters i really uh, even apache for that matter it had to modify it like three times uh, before we can really use it in our icu setups so very difficult to really come into the practicality of these scorings so for that matter i think curb 65 is an easy one to go back to any day and uh, when it comes to uh, deciding whether you're dealing with any particular uh, resistant pathogen that is the pes score pes stands for uh, pseudomonas uh, e stands for the uh, extended spectrum beta lactamase and uh, s stands for mrsa so the pes score will help you see whether you're dealing with a resistant pathogen so there is uh, parameters like any previous uh, uh, you know uh, drug resistance was already there previous infection was there or uh, whether there is a chronic renal failure case or you know in, uh, there are such uh, parameters which help to see whether you are dealing with a uh, resistant pathogen 
and then that is the drip uh, score drip score is drug resistance in pneumonia scoring so even that uh, deals with the same uh, almost same parameters little more elaborate so uh, when we really uh, do this practically it is possible to get down and really uh, do this for every patient and uh, you know try to solve uh, the a uh, big question whether the patient needs icu or not what is the mortality going to be like in this patient do i need to step up antibiotics do i need to de escalate so if i am suspecting that this may be a resistant pathogen i may need to change my antibiotics so there are a lot of uh, scorings that can help us but uh, there is no one score that really points out uh, cut and right that uh, this patient a uh, patient who is is going to have a bad prognosis or this patient is going to need so we really are depending more on uh, the our own clinical uh, acumen and we are going to uh, look at the daily uh, that is the other uh, disadvantage of scores we are not really getting down to doing this daily on on a daily basis for the icu patient how many of us really do it on a daily basis so that prognosis wise scoring is going to be very difficult and none of the scores are going to help us with daily uh, changes in the values so th that But, is uh, uh, dr deepthi tell me okay i agree with you scores we don't do daily we don't have a battery or uh, uh, a regiment of uh, residents with us all the time to do this regularly even if we have residents all the time they won't do it regularly so tell me one thing let's talk about the basic most test of all uh, blood work up let's talk about cbc how do you hematologically work up that to as regard cbc for pneumonias uh before that i would like to add a few things uh, please, please. as far as the pediatrics part is concerned i think we are uh, much more simpler you know you have uh, the diagnosis very clear it been to admit not to admit so if you have just uh, uh, if you have just cold cough nothing to be done opd basis then you have the diagnosis that if it's just a fast respiration or if it's actually pneumonia so the di diagnosis is very simple less than 2 months of age 60 if you have more than 60 breaths per minute you just this is pneumonia if it's 2 uh, months to 12 months the range comes to 50 12 months to 5 years is uh, 50 and uh, above 5 uh, years is 30 so if the rate is that high you just admit the patient that's the first thing and if there are any danger signs that uh, the child is not feeding at all if there is a persistent vomiting which is there the child is having lethargy there is convulsions or there is cyanosis there is tidor in a calm child or there is malnutrition and malnutrition is something which we need to assess, assess assess immediately you know so if the child is falling into the malnutrition just remember admit that patient because the child doesn't give you time before going down so i always say a very simple thing that uh, suppose you know the younger the child the lesser time you have for both improvement and you know crashing so the child is he the child can uh, you know one hour before you're going to say the child looks good and one other child can crash and the child is looking crashing and one other child may be sitting out so the things are very different in pediatrics and we have much much simpler things to do in pediatrics rather than all the scorings so that's the best part I mean, but vibhu i may, i would like to carry on with this so aap uh, don't you get any blood work up done or anything matlab how do you no, 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 obviously obviously we need to do the blood work up that is there i mean uh, with with us the basic work up is uh, your cvc and the chest x rays what we need to do and the crp then procal is there but uh, normally we don't get it done uh, that frequently uh, i mean obviously if the child is admitted uh, with us then obviously we are going to do the procal and if it's in the icu to that's going to be on a regular flow so those are the things which we normally do then you do the even the biofire nowadays is uh, done on most on a regular basis the swab test earlier used to be done but up uh, to mostly you know you go for the biofire and you have the cultures obviously which is there so these are the basic things which we obviously the the basic work up is going to remain more or less the same you're going to do the abg if the child is on ventilator and all but my point was that uh, you know when we say that the child is there in your opd you have to make a quick assessment the child may look apparently all right there's something called silent pneumonia in children and uh, that is what happens the child is playing the child is having cold cough and fever nothing 3 days 4 days 5 days the child had been playing very well and the child comes to your opd crashed so is in the in the uh, uh, emergency crashed so that is silent pneumonia when you get an extra done it's full of patch so just remember it it happens very frequently and uh, that is something so that's why we say if the child is unwell 
two days you can watch out at home third day you please bring him in let us just examine let's settle it out and uh, because a lot of time what happens suppose your respiratory rate is in the range of say about 50 and the child is uh, say uh, approximately say 2 years of age the child is eating so the mother is like ha bachcha is eating obviously if the child is unwell is going to eat less the child is not able to eat well you have to just understand he has just vomited once or twice but you don't understand the child is actually going down so that is something which we need to catch up so normally we give uh you know two days time we tell to every patient you take two days fine but in those two days we explain them all the danger signs if there is persistent vomiting if there is a high grade fever if there is convulsions anything like that then you have to bring him in just remember below 5 the major risk factor is that of febrile seizures too that also has to be taken into account right right so again deepthi i i thank you vibhu very matlab this is eye opening as a adult uh, pulmonologist about what children and uh, pediatricians have to look into but deepthi i would like again like to come back to that question on the basic hematology workup that we advise in adults sir again uh, whether to do uh, hematology workup or not is depending on the condition so it's not like uh, the patient comes with uh, fever cough and uh, chest pain or whatever suspicion of pneumonia and you just immediately uh-huh. treat for a cbc it is not like that but uh, when we are uh, um, considering a uh, doubt whether this is viral whether this is bacterial then uh, that is one uh, situation where we are going to immediately send for workups again when you are admitted whether it is ward or uh, icu then again we send up send all the workups so uh, the first most common of course is uh, a complete blood count so in that also the, particularly after covid there is a lot of hype uh, for uh, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio so uh, this neutrophil lymphocyte ratio was being done very regularly initially but now even when the covid is getting admitted uh, we hardly are, are able to do that uh, nlr uh, ratio but yes it is uh, very useful as a prognostic uh, factor and uh, what even the platelet uh, lymphocyte ratio for that matter even that initially we used to be doing and we used to sit and uh, solve for these uh, each uh, uh, cases we had around 11000 uh, covid cases in hassan so uh, but nowadays it is like uh, hardly uh, we go back and get uh, a plr ratio done and uh, uh, the problem with all this is uh, not only uh, solving but uh, nowadays i think the impact of covid itself has come down but uh, plr as such has a very good uh, uh, prediction for uh, prognosis that is at admission if a plr ratio is high more than 180 or something then we uh, can expect that the prognosis is going to be bad so even with nlr ratio for that matter at initial admission if uh, nlr is very high more than 10 then we can suspect that this patient is also probably going to turn out uh, with a bad prognosis so these are good parameters apart from that uh, to to uh, differentiate between viral and bacterial yes crp most of us are doing on a regular basis now but uh, again crp there are lot of uh, things that are uh, hold on hold on hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, you know i i only wanted to hear cbc from you because it's such a vital topic and you know nlr and plr basically nlr ratio absolutely for people who couldn't go for il6 ferritin levels in covid 19 which were a plenty nlr ratio was all that we had at that point of time and it is a really and basic and useful ratio and so, very low cost can be done uh, on a basis and, so it was yeah, yeah. so I, i would like to bring in atul latul is waiting for a long time there is this pro calcitonin which tony mentioned and uh, vibhu mentioned and deepthi wanted to mention now i want you to mention it pro calcitonin okay. do it or not do it so uh, before talking about pro calcitonin one thing i wanted to add to what toke sir told about fungal pneumonia on a uh, presentation of fungal pneumonia is where you have uncontrolled diabetes mellitus and mm-hmm. if the patient presents with hemoptysis so that is one common presentation i had seen in many cases of fungal pneumonia yes very right and, very right and coming to pro calcitonin so our indian pneumonia guidelines as well as ats and ers guidelines have given clear cut indications of what what to use for pro calcitonin like what is it to be used for so they have all, always told that pro calcitonin should never be used as an indicator to start your antibiotic therapy it can be just be used as an indicator to when to stop your de escalate your antibiotic 
therapy so what is procalcitonin procalcitonin is basically a protein which is released and it is mainly produced due to the bacterial endotoxins so that is why it is more increased in or more favor of a bacterial pneumonia so according to guidelines there is and but the viral pneumonia the thing is virals have interferon gamma which doesn't uh, help in the production or which inhibits procalcitonin production so there is a clear cut guideline as to procalcitonin should be used only to guide your antibiotic therapy so supposedly if you are given started the patient you are suspected a bacterial pneumonia you are started the patient on uh, antibiotic you can use a procalcitonin level whether to stop the antibiotic or reduce the antibiotic and one single value of procalcitonin can ca never be more meaningful you have to do a serial level of procalcitonin so supposedly and there are guidelines as to if it's in a normal patient if your procalcitonin level is less than 0.25 nanogram per ml so that is an indicator in which you can stop your antibiotic therapy so when when there is a guideline just from your from ers or ats that that uh, procalcitonin can never be used as a adjuvant to start your antibiotic therapy it can only be used to deescalate your antibiotic therapy and procalcitonin is something which has a high rate of false positivity as well as a false negative results as well because in post surgery trauma burns sepsis and other some chronic inflammatory condition procalcitonin levels can be raised and even in a chronic kidney disease patient sometimes what we see is procalcitonin levels are raised and i am talking irrespective of the bacterial pneumonia sometimes stress and inflammation can also increase your procalcitonin level so just using a procalcitonin to differentiate between bacterial and viral pneumonia may not be useful because you have other markers like your blood counts and ecg markers which can be done procalcitonin can something can be which can be used as a it has a it has a prognostic role as well because uh, it has found that procalcitonin levels which are high for a longer period of time have a poorer prognosis and uh, in some typical infections the procalcitonin level rises very less compared to atypical infections so in that way so it has a prognostic uh, tool and a single value of procalcitonin uh, cannot be always a guide scale you have to do serial procalcitonin level to see response to your antibiotic therapy right right it very very well elaborated and that is why intentionally i discussed procalcitonin before the thing which we all do very commonly so toke sir before i ask you about crp or hs crp i would like to uh, tell all of my fellow panelists that we have 1048 1048 people logged into our webinar just now and we want all of us to be very clear in giving this message like atul was very clear don't go ahead and do procalcitonin first off it has some other value that is what i want to hear from dr toke now how do you do crp when do you do crp and how do we use it please actually crp is a protein which is being produced by the hepatocytes that is from the liver in any case of inflammation infections so it is very much sensitive for the inflammation or infection that may be bacterial that may be viral that may be fungal or that may be parasitic infection it can be increased and it can be increased in the autoimmune diseases it can be increased in the ulcerative colitis crohn's disease like any inflammatory condition of the body gives rise to uh, irritation of this uh, c reactive protein actually as far as covid is concerned uh, at that point in time this uh, role of crp was very much elaborated because each and every patients there were some few diagnostic uh, torch of uh, uh, tests so we were going for that one initially if crp is high then we are considering uh, actually patient has uh, disease progression so it is it was used for the disease progression if disease is progressing of serial levels of crp we were using we were using and now also we are using for a few patients are the increasing or decreasing so that will give just rough idea regarding the disease is in progression or it is in the evolution or resolving phase and actually its value is less than 10 uh, mg per uh, liter and uh, it is it will increase within the 68 hours of any infection or inflammation and its, its value will be highest or peak will be reached after 48 hours of the infection or inflammation and it can be used for the disease progression as well as monitoring of the treatment if you are giving some treatment patient is improving or not with that level if levels are coming down compared to previous values so as dr atul has mentioned regarding procalcitonin that single value doesn't have value like that in the crp also we have to do serial crp levels to uh, say the disease is progressing or 
resolving. And uh, as far as one line I would like to tell regarding this HS highly sensitive CRP, which is actually is a uh, marker of the uh, myocardial ischemia or you can say myocardial stress. Uh, we can predict the if, if it is uh, highly elevated, we can predict there is something happening with the patient's coronaries and we have to go according to that one. So as far as this uh, infection and all those things are concerned, there is no role of uh, this HSCRP. Right. No, that, that is just a clarification. I thought this is the proper platform to clear our doubts also. Yes. So, so the, the, yeah, please, please. Uh, that uh, see, Another problem with CRP is it is affected by uh, any previous uh, antibiotic therapy uh, if the patient has already taken or already on steroid use. All these also alter CRP. So again, it is it should not be a diagnostic marker. It should be more of a prognostic marker. Right, right. So now coming to one more aspect of diagnosis, which is radiology. So Tony, by how would you go ahead with the radiology workup in case of viral or bacterial suspected pneumonias? Um, Nabi, uh, <clears throat> uh, basically, at first, uh, at the first outset, X-ray is the bare mm -hmm. minimum that we should be doing. In our, even if it is an open system, having uh, no facilities. And in the X-ray, the difference between viral, uh, earlier viral wouldn't show much uh, findings. But now since COVID has come up, we are finding more viral patches visible when the first X-ray is taken. But if you're looking for a bacterial pneumonia, usually you will find a very clear consolidation or a white patch which is having an air bronchogram going through that, which are both defining for a pneumonia. Now, some other classic features when we are studying, we were told that there's a bulging pressure, which we see in H, H influenza classically. But uh, nowadays, some studies, even Klebsiella and Legionella also have been started showing the same feature. So we cannot classify only based on the uh, X-ray sign. So that is where the uh, sending the biofire sample, the first sampling is important to come correlate to what we should narrow down our treatment to. Then from there, we proceed. If if you are strongly suspecting a, a viral, we are not seeing much signs in the X-ray, or we are seeing clear signs, but we want to access the extent of the damage, in the lungs, we have to go for a CT. So, in a CT, what we have to look is uh, to say in simple language, in general, the viral pneumonias show multifocal patchy consolidations with maybe some ground glass opacities. So, that is in general. But when you look particularly into influenza, there is usually you might find bilateral reticulo nodular areas of opacities with maybe small uh, consolidations also, and usually more in the lower lobes. Now, uh, also uh, ARDS, rapidly progressing into an ARDS kind of features also you have to think about uh, H1N1 and uh, organizing pneumonias too. Then, uh, and one, of, uh, as Dr. Vibhu has mentioned about adenovirus, in adults also rarely adenovirus can also cause complete infections, but then you will find it to be looking very similar to a bacterial bronchopneumonia because it will show as a low bar or a segmental distribution. So it will be quite clear that it looks very, very much like that. Then, uh, other than that, if you look at the, now in just a few, uh, that these are all the classic features. If you're looking at a Morxella catalyst, you might find GGOs with a bronchial wall thickening along with central lobular nodules. Now, if you're looking at a mycoplasma pneumonia, you might find patchy alveolar opacities with, again, bronchial wall thickening and central lobular nodules. If it is a, a suspected chlamydia, it might be usually be a, will usually be a unilobular involvement. Now, if let us say it's a patient who is a known acquired immunodeficiency syndrome patient and you're finding a diffuse GGO with interstitial infiltrates, first you suspect pneumocystic carinine before anything else. And again, any segmental, any segmental lobar infiltrates or opacities, kind of think of bacterial first. This is, this is, but then the remaining when you take a CT, it will be clear. So, uh, but one thing is there, nowadays, uh, uh, Dr. Toke, we are also concentrating on something which is midway between a X-ray and a CT scan, which is called as ultrasonography. So, what is your uh, opinion about the use of ultrasonography in pneumonia diagnosis? Actually, sir, uh, it has very good role. I have gone through two to three studies regarding this ultrasound in the pneumonia. Actually, it has a role in the early diagnosis of pneumonia. And uh, patients, severely ill patients who are coming, if they are immobile, they are on stretcher in emergency room, we can have a quick assessment, that is LUS, that is lung ultrasound, we can have a quick assessment, because X-rays qualities, because of this PA, uh, sorry, we are not able to take this PA view proper, AP views we have to take, and patient not be mobilized, so we can't give proper positioning, 
and such kind of uh, situation you may misdiagnose to some other conditions so at this point in time there is role of this lung ultrasound which is evolving and there is very much great learning curve towards this uh, lung ultrasound because it is new modality and we have to consider for not not to consider for each and every patient it will be again it will be costly but uh, patients who are on uh, immobile patient long standing intubated in the icu they are developing some new radiological signs on the chest x ray <clears throat> and that is uh, again ap view we are not able to diagnose it properly then we can go ahead with uh, this lung ultrasound it has very good uh, uh, two to three signs that we have to come up uh, we come across while doing this us g chest so first and foremost in early pneumonia there will be <coughs> development of b line <clears throat> and that is actually the reverberation reverberation of the ultrasound waves which will happen between the consolidated or uh, exuded filled alveoli and then surrounding the normal irradiated alveoli so there will be reverberation of the ultrasonic waves and that will uh, manifest as a b line so there is one another line that is called as thread line we will be seeing either this is at the junction or at the border of the irradiated lung and the consolidated lung which is actually diseased and one more thing i would like to tell regard when the consolidation as the disease or pneumonia progresses there will be development of this hepatization stage so lung will appear as a liver so we can see that in the ug or lung ultrasound initially also and whenever there is a development of sin pneumonic or para pneumonic effusion definitely we are very much uh, i think everybody pulmonologist they will be knowing how to see the pleural effusion or uh, hemothorax or pneumothorax on the ug but not much uh, uh, pneumonia till now because there is lot of learning learning curve so we can see the sin pneumonic effusion as well as if patient is going into the complicated para pneumonic effusion so there are uh, means debris falling so some exudate will be seen in that uh, effusion well, that is impyma so sin pneumonic uh, impyma you can say this complicated para pneumonic effusion so actually this much uh, uh, is the role of lung ultrasound as uh, we go ahead there is role for the op practice also because rather than to doing the chest x ray we can put the ultrasound uh, ultrasound probe on the patient chest and we can have a early diagnosis of pneumonia in patients right right quite right I, i think definitely ultrasound is becoming an upcoming thing but only thing is that of availability cost yes. so pocket ultrasounds we scans and all are coming up and i am think it's just a matter of time that we will be having to keep all of this with us because ultrasound is a very beautiful modality for pneumonia management so but one more gold standard for pneumonia management dr atul is cultures what is your take on cultures so cultures is something which we don't do routinely right now because it it's, it's a very long and tedious process and the point is viral pneumonia is something which we should treat at that point it's not like a tuberculosis or something even if it takes two weeks there won't be much of a change so viral cultures is something which takes a very very long time so we uh in my practice i normally don't send for cultures because it's something that report takes up to 4 or 6 weeks for it to uh, get a proper report so while doing viral pneumonia most of my diagnosis is based on either a clinical this thing a clinical approach or on your basic nasopharyngeal swab which we send for a rt pcr testing and maybe if it is um, uh, maybe if it is a uh, bronchoscopy or something you get a ball you can send it for biofire but biofire also uh i have my reservations i do have my reservation because of the cost which is there of that test and many a times are- i i agree with you but but i would like to bring in dr jipti was raising a point about biofire and rapid kits the pros and cons so dr jipti would you have anything to say about this biofire apart from the cost okay samne mana costly hai but i think none of us over here has not used it so i would really say it has it is have, um, going to be one another uh, uh, like sending for another gram stain or another uh, uh, afb stain in the near future because seeing the race in the number of cases seeing novel viruses coming into the picture seeing the way uh, there are a lot of uh, patterns different uh, uh, variants of the same virus 
I think it is best that we bring it into our regular practice to start uh, utilizing these uh, things on a regular basis. Only then the cost is going to come down. So uh, unless it is uh, really uh, widespread and uh, being used on a regular clinical basis, we can't expect costs to come down. So uh, biofire, yes, uh, not a lot of uh, centers have uh, bronchoscopy, not a lot of centers can uh, send for BAL. But a multiplex assay with PCR, uh, a, a simple swab, I think that should be done uh, on a more uh, definite uh, basis in uh, ICU setups. Right. Yeah. right. At this point of time, one very interesting comment by Dr. Tridip sir that uh, from Bombay that there are many fallacies of an expensive test like BioFire. You pick up uh, something like a bark virus or something like which, which becomes so confusing that you don't know ki you picked it up or what to do with it basically. So that is also one thing, over diagnosis and surprising diagnosis. But uh, Dr. Tony, now tell me, uh, viral and bacterial co-infection. Any way to diagnose them early? Uh, Ravi Bhai, basically, uh, one um, main thing we should think about is that when the when the as uh, Dr. Diti was talking about the viral markers, as long as you don't take the sample appropriately, if it is not taken the right way, it is not taken deep enough into the throat, you are not going to get a positive report. But not getting a positive report will nullify your efforts to the patient bystander. Because even if you are clear that what you're treating is what you what you're you're right symptomatically, your the report coming will not match with what you're treating means the patient thinks of what you are treating. Because now nowadays everybody is behind the legal implications and looking for proof and evidence for everything. So that is why if you if you are setting as a tool set a very costly investigation of 15, 16,000 rupees, it has to be justified that you're taking a good enough sample, and especially let us say it's a bad patient presenting. In an intubation phase, as soon as you intubate, take the first sample from the EQT, and that was the best sample to send for it before you start any medication for that patient. Then that's you can at least correlate correctly. But after that, any step of forwards is all a part of co-infection starts. Then once a co-infection starts, when you are treating the patient, you have to be that is let us say patient presented in a viral so respiratory failure, then starts worsening with the bacterial secondary, or patient came in with the bacterial and got a secondary viral from the hospital itself. Now, in both ways, the issue is that if you don't find the patient, let us say every 24 to 48 hours responding to the line of treatment that you have constituted for that patient based on the initial symptoms, you have to reevaluate if something else has come up or not. So, number one, as uh, Atul was talking earlier about procalcitonin, I actually find that procalcitonin is actually more we see it only when the bacterial comes in compared to only the viral. So, if you are feeling patient is really bad, you're suspecting a bacterial co infection, if you do a CRP is also high, you do a PCT, it is negative. At least you are sure it's not a bacteria. You are sure you have to continue your focus on the viral itself. But you know, now, but you don't use Procal to decide to start antibiotic or not. Now, let us say your patient is already on a high-end antibiotic, but patient is uh, you check Procal. Procal has come down. Patient is still getting a new onset, maybe a fever or a new infiltrate. Then you consider about maybe it's a new onset viral in that picture coming in. So that and then in either way the CRP will go. And as Dr. BP said. Let us say we are using steroids. The purpose we may have an asthma co-infection, maybe a cold COPD. We need to use a level, maybe a minimal, at least a minimal level of steroids. Definitely, you cannot fully believe the CRP reports after that, because especially the CRP shows significant response to steroids. Many times I have had patients where the PC is going up, CRP is coming down. I stop the steroid, patient is better and goes home with the normal report. Because obviously, when you're showing the PC counts is still 15,000, 16,000, patient may not be happy or confident that is it is they out of the infection yet. But when you stop the steroid, automatically all this comes out. So we have to consider the entire spectrum. So same way, when in, a, in a, a, a study show in a viral pneumonia with a secondary bacterial, that we can usually find the Procal also shows a 64% specificity that it is correlating the situation. But every patient is individual scenarios. We have to temper how we put the investigations and we have to be able to justify the investigations to the bystanders. So as I was saying earlier, the, when we send the investigation, the sampling, if it is not perfect, if it is not perfect, then everything comes a waste from the patient by standard point of view. I think, but uh, I agree, quality sampling, quality processing, they are all the essence of all diagnosis, I think. But like Dr. Deepthi had told, ki clinical sense, whatsoever what it is, but our clinical sense makes us understand. So now coming to the uh, a very, very important aspect of pneumonia is the treatment part. 
So, Dr. Atul, I would like to hear from you in a in a very concise way how the guidelines recommend pneumonia treatment in adults, and what do you think should we commonly use some of the drugs that are that we see commonly? We see many people writing a lot of doxy, azithromycin, or even levofloxacin. Is it proper? Okay, sir. So basically, when you are talking about the treatment of community acquired pneumonia, you have treatment for OPD setting as well as for IP settings. And in inpatient settings, you have further classification into an ICU inpatient or a ward or room inpatient. So if it is an OPD patient and if the patient doesn't have any comorbidities, then your mainstay of treatment is either a beta lactam, it's a beta lactam uh, monotherapy. Uh, according to ATS guidelines, you can give a levofloxacin monotherapy but indian pneumonia guidelines is against it they say you don't give a levofloxacin monotherapy because in india there is always a risk of tuberculosis then when you come if the patient has a comorbidity like a copd or a heart condition or a post transplant or whatever in such cases you give a combination of a beta lactam antibiotic plus a, a macrolide like azithromycin if the patient has any hypersensitivity reaction to a beta lactam or or to a macrolide, you can replace a macrolide with a doxycycline or maybe levoflox. So levoflox, the thing is the Indian pneumonia guidelines are uh, not that favor in favor of a levoflox, especially a levoflox monotherapy. Then you come to IP settings. In IP settings, uh, there is uh, a patient who is in the ICU as well as patient who is in a ward. If it's in a ward or something, you can use a combination of a beta-lactam antibiotic plus a macrolide. Now, in place of macro, just as I told, if the patient has hypersensitivity to any of the antibiotics, you can replace it either with a doxycycline or a levoflox. Now, coming to ICU settings, in ICU settings, you can give a, you have to look at whether it is a pseudomonas. If there is a propensity of pseudomonas erogenesa in your place, in such cases, you have to use a combination of anti-pseudomonal penicillins plus a macrolide. Otherwise, you can use a combination of a beta-lactam plus a macrolide or even levoflox. Now, the ERS or AT, the ERS guidelines are always in favor of using levoflox whenever possible. And even in Indian pneumonia guidelines, if it's a severe pneumonia and the patient is in ICU, they have also uh, told that you can use uh, aminoglycosides as well. And the basic thing is, if the patient is ICU or basing in, in hospital, you have to send sputum cultures and depending on the sputum cultures, you have to escalate or de-escalate your antibiotic therapy uh, mm -hmm. after uh, the culture reports are available. So the only thing is in Indian setup, if you are giving levofloxacin, the guideline clearly mentions you have to send a sputum AFB of the patient as well to rule out tuberculosis. And depending on the then rest, depending on the culture, depending on the patient is not responding, you can change the antibiotics accordingly. But now, uh, uh, Itna simple to the kya thi. Tony bhai, what if you get an MDR bacteria on a good quality culture? Now tell me, how would you treat it? An MDR bacteria. Tony uh, <clears throat> bhai, basically, uh, when we now we are in the age of uh, HDR and uh, total drug resistance now, but now MDR is the basic uh, categorization is when you have at least one antimicrobial drug resistance in uh, three or more antibiotic categories. Three categories, resistance, and you find it as a multi-drug resistant. Number one thing is you have to, that is definitely you have got a culture report or on the basis of which you're classing it, classifying it as MDR. But after that, there will there'll be a basic MIC value mentioned in that report. So that is a minimum, minimum inhibitory concentration. Based on that value, you have to decide which is it is towards the better spectrum of the sensitivity the antibiotic is showing or not. And usually in most of the uh, chronic colonizers, which we find in the respiratory tract, we have to maybe give an extended antibiotic course of usually maybe one or two antibiotics combination. And that is usually depending on the underlying um, other comorbid issues for the patient and any other lung, any other organ dysfunction. For example, if the patient is already having an underlying CKD or kidney issue, then we have to look at which is the maybe the MIC may be uh, lesser, but the patient will respond better to that drug. You can give it for a longer course. But if the, um, the patient is otherwise okay, then we have to hit the patient with the best combination with the MIC best response for that duration of minimum 7 to 10 days. It can go up to 14 to 21 days to clear chronic infections. And um, usually, uh, let us say the uh, patient is having the infection, the patient is improving in the first two three days. Uh, and initially, we have to start off the patient's treatment in the ICU. But uh, if the patient is having, let us say, the patient is being shifted out from the ICU, 
and then we have to always that is uh, what i usually do is in the fourth or fifth day i will send a repeat culture sample after even after initiating on a drug regimen because we have in, in the first four to five days we'll come to know if any new resistance is emerging from the medicines we are giving to the organisms in the body or if any other infection has set in because in i choose there can be cross infections so then then we have to be able to look out if a new fever or new spike comes so that is usually the uh, general thing about uh, infection but this mdr bacteria is a very very large broad spectrum topic so i will humbly request krishna sir to please consider a different uh, more detailed uh, talk on this topic for our general public to understand definitely but now coming to the other aspect or the main aspect of today's talk which is antivirals so toke sir uh, what are the available antivirals so currently uh... we are using for as far as covid 19 is concerned the remdesivir within first 10 days of illness can use with some uh, results and as far as this influenza is concerned there is oseltamivir that is uh, which is very much uh, commonly and uh, routinely prescribed as a right and left for each and every for pediatric as well as uh, adult population which is actually neuraminidase inhibitor followed by zanamivir which is actually inhalational therapy that is Work. dose is actually 5 mg uh, brd for 5 days and followed by there is a paramivir which has been given iv i have not used this drug i think uh, you may um, some of you might have used that drug and uh, just i was going through this who guidelines for the influenza today they have mentioned this inhaled the lani namivir uh, as a uh, one of the newer drug for this one there are trials going on but who has mentioned as a uh, treatment for this uh, influenza illness influenza like yeah. illness as well as for influenza but but one yes. thing one thing i uh, sorry to cut you uh, atul had mentioned on his presentation h3n2 in covid 19 about the drugs which you talked about tell me one thing that in your clinical practice do you have a habit of writing oseltamivir on your opd prescription if you are suspecting viral pneumonia it's very uh, uncommon time i will be writing this uh, oseltamivir sir out of 10 patients you can say only one patient Maximum one patient, I will be writing this oseltamivir. Not more than that. Right. So my yeah, experience thing about oseltamivir is that if if you don't start it within five days, there is no use. Ah, uh, well, so I think even within the first five days, and depending on the patient profile of your the area in which you are practicing. So many a times uh, there used to be a hair uh, many like there was days when twenty to twenty five pneumonias used to get admitted. so in that time we always used to think on the back of the mind that it is always a uh, viral pneumonia it can be h1n1 because of the region propensity so in sometimes we used to start fluvir that way or oseltamivir sorry in that way scientific yeah. recent ah please tony bhai team please uh, ravi bhai from uh, one example is that uh, when the patient comes to in the op like uh, you are asking patient comes to the op the most simple question is anybody in the family had a viral fever in the last 5 days to 1 week That person should get oseltamivir. Right, right. But in Dr. pediatrics, uh, in okay. pediatrics, what I have seen is, uh, you know, some of the people are using it left, right, center, and uh, yes, the, the main problem which what I face is, when should I start? I mean, the child usually comes to you on day three or day four. I mean, what's the point of starting on day three or day four? I mean, you, you want to start, you have to start early. So it it becomes a bit difficult for me. But uh, if you see. in uh, again going back december january there was a time period when it, this uh, molecule was not available in the market it was like every second person every you know every quack was also writing it as if this is a wonder drug and then those children used to come to me about uh, seventh or eighth day with secondary infections and all so i mean it's like you you just say that okay this is a wonder drug just give it for every cold and cough it doesn't work that way so i think we should be more uh, you know i mean if it's like a thing that flu season is on there are a lot of children in the school who are having this and you have a history the child is coming to you on the first or second day it's fine but if the child is coming to you on third or fourth day i think it doesn't make sense because uh, i think because you know, of, like you also mentioned that you are you are starting with one out of 10 but the fact is that one person might be coming to you on day one otherwise yes. nine would not come to you on day one Definitely. so as you mentioned uh, sir i will take one minute Uh, as you mentioned rightly that it, it drug uh, this oseltamivir was used and being used in the past as well as now also as a right and left so 
lot of resistance uh, has been developed to this drug i think uh, we have to i will uh, means uh, request krishna sir to regarding this we have to uh, do some study regarding this uh, oscillatory uh, resistance patterns in the uh, influenza because everybody using like uh, sana putana you can say uh, patient is getting that fluid so that is not right way as far as uh, my practice is concerned so uh, i would also like to add another thing is that we are actually focusing on uh, the influenza part but uh, just remember in children you have uh, the chicken pox breaks also which are there and you have uh, you know the measles are also coming up so when you have the measles and the chicken pox especially in the chicken pox we normally use the acyclovir also in the children especially in the older children and i think it it helps in that way that it probably curtails the time period uh, you know the child is going to suffer and then we can prevent the complication of a pneumonia in such children so that is there i mean it doesn't have a direct role as far as the respiratory part is concerned but i think acyclovir works pretty well as far as uh, you know if you get chicken pox kind of patients and we get quite uh, commonly these kind of patients uh, especially the break cases you know the break cases are the ones who have been vaccinated they were still got the pox so they are the ones if you just start with the acyclovir for a period of about 5 days it works pretty well and we don't land up with the, the complications of uh, especially the pneumonias right but like dr vibhu uh, post viral do you see some complications in children uh yes a lot of complication in children so one is the pneumonias and all which is there and uh, then you know the most common which was there in uh, during the covid times was basically the multi system in, uh, inflammatory syndrome which was there uh, when i said it was most common because that was the most common icu uh, admissions which were there although this was a very rare uh complication then you have the red rashes the pneumonias uh you have the bleeding uh, nose the bleeding from the gums which is common then you have the weight loss which you know for us weight makes a very big difference uh, doc- dr dosi hamare liye bhi weight loss karna zaruri hai wo ek alag cheez hai but you know overall if you see uh these children when you, when they lose weight you know it makes a difference imagine a child who is about 10 kg and losing about 10% of the weight you know that 1 kg it took the parents a hell lot of time to get that 1 kg and it's lost in about 7 or 8 days then you have the stiff joints which is again uh, very common uh, you know post viral uh, myositis is uh, pretty common in case of the children uh, what i've seen another thing is the tb activation so i think which probably i think all of us must have seen uh, the post viral uh, especially post covid the tb has been quite common so these are the usual complications which we find and uh, with children uh, especially the mostly is the rashes and uh, you know not eating well losing weight right. these are the right. usual things right dr toke what do you see common in your practice post viral any any complications in your practice yes sir post uh, uh, pulmonary complications there will be uh, uh, decrease in the diffusing capacity of the lung as well as there will be hypoxia in few patients and few patient uh, patient will be given persistent dry cough for many months they will be getting up the post viral illness as far as re- hematological sequence is uh, there is increase uh, thromboembolic phenomenon as uh, we have experienced and we are experiencing with the covid 19 and with the other illness also because of immobilization as well as isolation there has been increased chances of thromboembolic phenomenon as far as this cardiovascular sequelae is concerned there will be lot of uh, tachycardia few patients tremors some patients will be getting restrictive cardiomyopathy and some patients will be land up into the myocardial infarction on the longer way because of metabolic stress which has been uh, created at the time of this uh, viral pneumonia as the patient has been admitted and was hospitalized in the icu for uh, two days and as far as neuro psychiatric sequelae i would like to tell one more thing that is post traumatic disorder which we have seen in lot of patients of uh, this post covid 19 disease as well as renal there is uh, no much uh, uh, improvement uh, decrease in the uh, easy far has been noted in follow up 6 months of the study and endocrinology uh, as we have seen with the covid if there is steroid used or not used for covid but lot of patient has got their elevated uh, means blood sugars got elevated after the recovery from the illness and uh, the patient has got this uh, gastroenterologist uh, like loss of commensals and they are getting some irritable bowel like right. a very very broad spectrum very broad spectrum of complications we are seeing post viral right. dr deepthi tell me quick a word about antiviral resistance the, the topic was touched upon by dr toke would you like to uh, give any any inputs on this thing 
the antiviral resistance was seen from a very long period so only thing is there are a lot of viruses which are innately uh, resistant to the drug because of the uh, mutation and the problem is that if that virus is spreading it spreads very fast it is easy to uh, for the viruses to spread fast so the problem with resistance is that uh, innately a resistant virus can spread fastly and uh, worsen the uh, situation clinically for us so the only way out of this is when you are suspecting that a regular uh, case is not improving again send for a biofire because there are a lot of antiviral resistance markers available under biofire to uh, detect uh, uh, for uh, resistance and another uh, way out of this is to use a combination of many drugs so you you use uh, two drugs three drugs so not only are you reducing the dose of the drug but you're also able to uh, attack the virus from uh, very uh, too many uh, places and so right. you can right. yeah quite right so now tell me uh, we have treated we have diagnosed we have seen clinical features now how can we prevent them tony bhai in adults can we use anything any vaccinations to prevent pneumonia in uh, in general the based on our seasonal fluctuations in india we have to take the influenza vaccine so usually in the first half of the year we prefer to take the northern hemisphere variant and from now downwards we take the southern hemisphere variant and usually once a year vaccination is enough for the influenza coverage and that i that's a it's a thing that we have the tetravalent vaccine for uh, influenza that for gsk is what i usually prefer because it's made internationally it's of high quality and Same. usually yeah. patients have a good enough spectrum of protection but it has to be repeated every yearly especially for our respiratory prone patients in general public vaccination is only enough for the acute period of time once the season is over it's okay but our patients have to repeat every year and along with that i we usually prefer to according to the advisory committee on the immunization prior practices they recommend that every adult greater than 65 years old and every 18 year old with any risk factors above that should also take the pneumococcal vaccination and usually that is we have the uh, prevenar which is the pcv13 which is usually given for children and for uh, immunity compromised adults i prefer giving that first and after that we give the uh, the ppsv23 the pro polyvalent and in adults we can usually start off with the polyvalent vaccine 23 and after 5 years we have to repeat once more after that right. for overall immunity now 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 coming to dr vibhu vibhu bhai vaccination in your armatorium in children is huge please please enlighten us okay so uh, you know the, the limit it's it's the same uh, we need to give the influenza vaccine and i prefer to vaccinate all my children and i you know try to vaccinate even the parents and whoever is accompanying the children because just remember one thing uh whoever is unvaccinated it's a covid kind of a situation whoever is unvaccinated is going to actually create trouble for the vaccinated people also you know some way like i mentioned about uh, the chicken pox vaccine so even if you got the chicken pox vaccine then also you can have break cases so you know to 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 uh, 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 counter the spread of the virus everybody should be vaccinated so i disagree with this fact that okay only our respiratory patients i would say everybody should be vaccinated we should catch as much as possible and i think uh, government is actually not really serious about uh, getting it into the government schedule right now but maybe a few years later we might have it in the government schedule another thing is uh, uh, i don't really have any more vaccines because he's already uh, spoken about uh, the prevenar so less than 2 years we can give the ppsv we cannot give before 2 years of age but uh, we give the prevenar thing which is there uh, with us we have another vaccine which is available with us which is uh, the pcv10 which we give to children so that's a cheaper version and uh, that is uh, i mean prevenar is uh, uh, pcv13 the cheaper ones uh, gsk has uh, is uh, synflorix and it comes as neomocel by bharat biotech i think so these are the vaccines which are available to us another thing is like in adults i think the zooster vaccine is also coming up very soon uh, which is uh, going to be launched probably the end of this month it is expected so i think you know we all probably will get it for our parents so we are none of us look to be eligible except for dr todi for uh, the zooster vaccine it is to be given above 55 na so and <laughs> so according to gold guidelines also has advice for this uh, adult vaccination this uh, booster vaccine so uh, bibu
सिंगल वैक्सीन सो सपोज अ चाइल्ड यू नो दूजल थे सपोज अ चाइल्ड यू गिवेन टू वैक्सीन दिस इयर एंड इट्स इट्स देयर इन आर शेड्यूल द आई एपी शेड्यूल एट सिक्स एंड सेवन मंथ्स सो सिक्स एंड सेवन मंथ्स यू गिवेन नाउ यू गोट रिपीटेड आफ्टर द नेक्स्ट इन द नेक्स्ट सीजन इज गोट बी वन 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 एवरी इयर सपोज अ चाइल्ड मिसेज अ पर्टिक्युलर इयर देन नेक्स्ट इयर आइडली यू हैव टू गिव टू वैक्सीन so that is for the boosting effect so but that is still uh, what age there's a lot of there's a lot of controversy which is going on on that so this boosting effect is to be done till what age 10 years so, 15 years what age? No, no. so uh, we talk only up to 12 years okay we talk only up to 12 years so it's not about the boosting effect is to be done the thing is as far as the adults is concerned suppose you get it this year next year you don't get your vaccine the next year you get you get you take a single vaccine right when with children this thing is like l- initially you give two vaccines and then you give one every year now the question is suppose somebody misses at say about 4 years of age a child is missed is a uh, flu shot at the 4 years now at 5th year whether you will give one or two it's it's a very hot topic in our pediatrics too and there's been a lot of controversy but more or less everybody agrees that it's better to give two rather than going for one right so but uh, tell me dr vibhu uh, like uh when when children come to you with pneumonia do you see any anything that you advise their mothers regarding any any prenatal care postnatal care or in general anything that parents can do which helps in preventing pneumonia in their children see what you can do is so uh, with, with us uh, the things are very different like uh, you know we, we start at birth let's start at birth so you need to burp your child so if you are going to burp your child because with us what happens is like you know the normally how much is should be the burping so the burping suppose you feed the child well and you burped for say about 5 minutes and then you had put the baby down now the baby is lying in a supine position the baby is going to have another burp is going to bring out the milk and that's going to go into your lungs and that's going to cause pneumonia so aspirations are pretty common during the first up to 5 years is very common so even you know with with my own children you know my experience was that uh, once you give them uh, feed i think you all must have also experienced the same thing okay once you feed them they eat well then they vomit and then they have a second round of f- food so you know you feed them then you make them sit or walk around instead of uh, making them lie down so i think this issue goes on for a pretty long period of time another thing is like in children the most common cause of vomitings and aspirations is the nose blockage which we normally you know nobody looks at it so if the child is coming to you with a lot of chest retractions and everything if you just see there's just a nose blockage which is there there is something then the foreign bodies are pretty common so we have you know all those issues which come up so we have to see that okay if you give steaming you don't give ice creams and all you take uh, care of uh, you know the nasal part and all so you can prevent as far as the pneumonia part the second thing is obviously the school the role of school comes where uh, obviously if the child is sick the normally you know the child should be sent back home but nowadays we we see a lot of parents because see if both the parents are working they say ke theek hai the why though let's send the school uh, the child to the school now you send the child to the school with the medicine but the thing is that the child is going to make another 40 children sick so these are i think probably the social factors you know it's not only the parents it's actually as a whole society we have to work on that Sanit- uh, sanitation the bad sanitations so if you are going to uh, like i i in the evening i had a mother who was saying that you know why my child always gets uh, diarrhea you know i have to visit you almost every 15 20 days you know the first thing she did was when she had put her child on the couch she took out the shoes with her hands and then that put her on the chair which is there for the patients so i said look do you do this kind of thing at your home also you are putting it on this the, on my chair another child is going to come and sit over here and going to touch that area and may, that may go into his mouth so you have to understand that as a society unless we evolve i think the things will not really improve so that is with the diarrhea but then the similar is with the respiratory the children are coming with a nose flowing why don't you clean them i mean you have certain things which the mothers right, and right, the parents right. can do coming to nose flowing dr tony do you think role of masking is there in pneumonia prevention in the society 
Hundred percent, hundred percent. In with the present scenario of viral infection spreading in the community, community-based infections being stronger, we everybody not being vaccinated, and even COVID, the revaccinations are not uh, up to the mark. We should be masking even children going to school. And no, at, no, 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 no. I I disagree. Less than five years, you should not be masking. Less okay. than five years, you Why? should not be masking. Because no. it, you know. No, no, you should not be masking less than five years of age. It doesn't really have uh, any sense. It it spreads more of infection in uh, children less than five. So it is not re really recommended because, because of five. because of contact. Oh yes, because of the contact. So normally it is not recommended below five years of age. So, so, above, so above five years. Above five years, obviously yes. Above five. See, as long as you know how to handle the mask. Then only there's a point of masking. There's no point of masking in a child because then they are going to wipe their uh, stuff with that, and they're going to eat with the same thing. So it it works like a second uh, uh, a hanky rather than a mask. So tell me, uh, so, when, so uh, uh, especially uh, reusing of masks not be done because of that same droplet issue. Never, it's a very dangerous. Yeah, but tell me, Atul, is there any role of nutrition in pneumonia prevention? So basically, sir, if you eat healthy, you stay healthy. Hmm. So when you have when you have done various studies on pneumonia, whatever they have found is many of them have uh, the mortality or the prognosis is poorer in especially in people who have lower levels of vitamin C. So this was a study which was done before COVID. It was done pre-COVID in various viral pneumonias um, in the Western world, and they found that people who had a poorer prognosis with pneumonia. Uh, they had a low level of vitamin C, and they were under oxidant stress, and they have more of uh, carbonates and everything in their body. So always a diet which is rich in your fibers and your vitamin C, as well as some studies have shown that a high protein diet is also uh, useful in. It's not in preventing. Even if you get a pneumonia, it's more of coming out uh, like uh, the prognose, the prognostic yeah. part. So there is no diet Early that can prevent the pneumonia yeah. from occurring. You can just keep your immune system. Uh, healthy, so that you don't get a pneumonia or any infection for that sir. So basically, a balanced diet, rich in protein, with rich in vitamin C. I think uh, there is a role of vitamin D too, especially in the case of the children. I think the role of vitamin D is very important because we, what we have seen is the children whose uh, vitamin D level remain on the higher side. They their immune system is much better. They, I mean, they they have lesser chances of getting sick. So this is what I've seen, and another thing which I've seen in the case of children. I mean, it may be unrelated, or uh, I mean, I don't know. But uh, what we have discussed in our pediatric forums too, the children who are fully vaccinated normally tend to get less sick as compared to the children who are not fully vaccinated. When I say fully vaccinated, it is not only the essential vaccines as per the government of India, but the vaccines which are overall there. Because see, the government of India has limited uh, vaccines which are there in the government uh, schedule, but then the Indian the Academy of Pediatrics has all the vaccines. So once the children have been fully vaccinated, I think there are a lot of children. These are the children who normally fall sick much less as compared to the children who have not been vaccinated. So tell me, uh, Dr. Deepthi, is there any cloro of water? <coughs> Dr. Deepi, you are mute. Hello. I'm sorry, I didn't get your question, sir. Dr. sound was breaking. Dr. Dosi, your sound has been breaking. Drinking water. Now, now, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. yeah I, I just wanted to ask Dr. Deepi, is there any role of near? Clean drinking water in pneumonia prevention. Yes, sir. Obviously, I mean, just like uh, he said, uh, Atul was saying, eat healthy uh, and be healthy. I think drink healthy and be healthy is also equally applying. So there is a whole uh, wash uh, intervention uh, being uh, propagated by WHO. That is uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene. So that is very important for uh, sanitary, uh, like uh, not only diarrheal and other GI conditions, but respiratory as well. Because uh, e even if they have other, other uh, infections, ultimately the immune system is coming down and they are prone for respiratory infections. Right. So, okay. Now, yeah. uh, Dr. Toke, I think of all the vaccinations in adults, I think pneumococcal vaccination has a very critical role. Any line, any, any words in support for it? 
definitely sir there are a lot of studies which has mentioned regarding this pneumococcal vaccination as all of us know regarding pneumonia which are community acquired around 65 to 70 percentage of the pneumonia etiological agent will be this pneumococcus so it has very uh, pivotal role in the uh, prevention of this pneumococcal pneumonia and mm-hmm. it reduces the burden economical burden as well as uh, national uh, economical burden uh, by decreasing the patients right. hospital visits right. and hospitalization I think we have had a very elaborate panel discussion. One very interesting topic was raised by Dr. Tony about chest physiotherapy. So, does chest physiotherapy have a role in phys- in pneumonia prevention? Anyway, uh, or it is a, uh, what we should think is if it is an it early is infection. The, matter of fact, anyway, you asked about respiratory therapy, right? Yeah, chest physio, chest physiotherapy, physiotherapy, chest physiotherapy. So uh, basically, uh, the multimodality approach of treating a pneumonia should include chest rehabilitation. So in uh, in the OP basis, right. number one approach is in the OP basis when the patient presents. If they are having right. Right. good enough sputum, we we can do a chest physiotherapy session with a good RT uh, respiratory therapy session and get good enough sample elicited out. That is will give, will give us a better diagnosis in the first place. Second, as a part of the treatment process, once we are admitting the patient. If we do a daily rehabilitation, daily chest physiotherapy with mucolytics, it clears out the focus from the lungs and helps the drugs to act better, and the patient to recover faster. Now, along with that, as a part of the post-infection, as a part of post-infection pulmonary rehabilitation, <clears throat> even breathing exercises have to be taught to the patient to be done daily to recover their lung function, which they will lose as a part of the infection. And the second is that they can continue this exercising process at home so that they don't develop a reinfection in the in that process. so good quality chest physiotherapy especially by a trained respiratory therapist is very important for any respiratory right. institute so so, so i think we, we come to the end of our panel discussion uh my sound is breaking yes sir uh, i want i want i want to uh, raise uh, one uh, doubt that because we are there we are actually uh, facing a lot of uh, lot of in audience all over india Uh, one one point which i think we have we all should uh, t- think about also is the sudden deaths that we are seeing in patients and the uh, what is the reason for that so from from what i have i have usually seen is that in even in younger populations their patients after a viral infection are more prone to a myocarditis so usually when i find patients are uh, 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 as as bt uh, earlier told the symptoms are not matching with what we are seeing with the patient or the, the radiology is not matching with the uh, symptoms usually i'll send a d dimer to check what is the level of coagulopathy and in 50 60% of the the patients predicted to go bad the d dimer will be elevated and even a small short course maybe 2 weeks to 3 weeks of anticoagulation usually very fast helps them to recover in the entire process of the, the disease so that d dimer is one point which is an add on investigation that can be done in the present scenario of our mixed viral bacterial all these things to have a, to avoid a patient going to a sudden death kind of or a myocarditis kind of event and i, I don't know how the correlation is with bariatrics that we will have to answer <laughs> right so now uh, we 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 come to the end of our panel discussion uh, now there are some questions from our audience i'd like to quickly go through them mrs bindu from kerala arnakulam asked that post pneumococcal pneumonia do we need to vaccinate i think uh, we should sir because uh, th- there are so many variants that uh, any one variant would have affected the patient but uh, we are still uh, uh, covering up for the other variants when we are giving the vaccine so yes okay. usually right. one one to two months after the active infection we can give the uh, vaccination right and yes. also also control other comorbid reasons why the um, patient patient develops normally we phase. stick we stick to the theory of four weeks mm mm-hmm. one more question from dr ramakant from amravati is how to differentiate between lower interstitial and other pneumonias i think dr tony very very elaborately described it in his uh, answer on uh, radiology in diagnosis one more question by dr ramakant from amravati is duration of antibiotics in mild to moderate pneumonia if it's a if it's an opd patient we give it usually for a period of 5 days and if it is Uh, ward admission or a room admission, we can give it for a period of seven days. Right. And it also depends. Suppose if it's a culture which came positive on the third day, and if you switch the antibiotic, then you have to start from day one and give it for a period of seven days. 
like and also the patient and on the underlying comorbidities of the comorbidities of the patient that is one more so question in children, from, in children normally we uh, the culture positive we give for about 14 days 14 days uh, well. culture for culture positive now one one more observation and question from uh, lucknow uttar pradesh is why chest viral infections are increasing could climate change be responsible i think climate change we we didn't discuss but yeah maybe you never know may at least the changing levels of humidity is usually responsible for a lot of allergy exacerbations for infections maybe it still has to be proven scientifically even pollution 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 yeah one more that is one more question from uh, muniyappan iswaran from tamil nadu are viral infections common in the summer well uh, many take on that are viral infections common in the summer no not yeah. exactly not exactly the viral infections per se the respiratory are less but we see more of the viral diarrhea and all but that also we see more in the winters so i think it's uh, the spring and the autumn which uh, have the maximum viral issues and in the winters we have more of uh, we have the rsv and all uh, coming up in the winters for the children but in summers usually it's uh, uh, kind of uh, off viral stuff so summer usually it's it's mild, milder milder presentations i think probably, because probably doc- dr tony you are in kerala na so you don't see summers come to delhi i'll show you what summers are <laughs> when you have the 55 degrees temperature then you realize that the summers are nothing Now, will survive outside dr dr tridiv was asked us a couple of very interesting questions i would like to take them up one by one why high dose flu vaccines are not available in india especially for elderly immunocompromised patients like group e copd so any take on that why high dose flu vaccines are not available in india uh so that has uh, i'll take that question because uh, the high dose flu vaccine is available in the us uh, for the elderly and the immunocompromised but in india right now you know the vaccine which is available is only the standard uh, tetravalent vaccines which have come uh, the main thing is uh, basically the it's all about uh, the acceptance and uh, all about the market thing just remember one thing that the market forces drive these things you know you you you, you can't uh, bring a vaccine the companies can't just get the vaccine inside and then not able to sell it so just see how much is the acceptance now if you see your own practice except for your respiratory patients how many patients of your patients who are uh, their relatives ready to take the flu vaccine so with me also you know if i if i tell the with the children they are ready to take the flu vaccine ke theek hai ye laga do because the child has to go to school and you know the child will be less unwell probably but when you tell their parents probably if i am going to convince 100 pa- uh, parents not more than 30 or 20 get convinced that okay fine we can get it because see it's so imagine if you get a high dose flu vaccine for say 65 and above where where you going to get the people to get the thing so and in the us persons, how many of us have taken how many of us have taken <laughs> okay i take it i take it but okay good but now the doctor rh uzagare from maharashtra asked that is there a medicine for viral pneumonia i think dr atul is very elaborately told and dr toke is also told about antivirals in pneumonia tridip sir asked that does tamiflu work better for h1n1 rather than h3n2 any take on that dr atul anything no oh, so there is no data supporting whether it's more of uh, it is works better for h1n1 or h3n2 basically what data says is the treatment protocols of h1n1 is applicable for h3n2 as well because it's just a mutant variation of the basic h1n1 so we don't have any other antiviral for h3n2 as such we give oseltamivir uh, but there is no data showing whether it's better in h1n1 or h3n2 but it was the resistance specific. patterns uh, it was amantidin and uh, ritonavir which was found to be resistant, resistant to, uh, to h3 h3 and not azeltamivir yeah. so not azeltamivir but actually it uh, this azeltamivir came for h1n1 only studies were done for the h1n1 only mm-hmm. and it works better for the h1n1 as per as uh, this spn which has uh, new stain which has recently you know see In the nice. so so with this uh, i officially would like to come to the end of our two hour long marathon discussion on the changing paradigm of pneumonias how viral are taking over bacterial and i would really as a moderator like to tell you that throughout the discussion we were we in the whole spectrum there was viral there was bacterial but most of the time we were talking about both of them together only so that is what it is and with this i would like to thank all of my fellow panelists for their valuable time and valuable insights on the topic i would like to thank cci krishna sir for this opportunity and i would like to wish all of you a very good night 
थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू थैंक यू कृष्णा सर थैंक यू सर